to the cloud. Okay, we are recording. All right. So I am going to start. I don't know how well you guys are even going to be able to see the whiteboard, but you know what? We're doing the best we can with what we have. Um, so some reminders and or updates and things. Um, my Zoom office hours, visiting hours this week, I have to move a little bit because um, I'm sitting in interviews for hiring somebody on campus. Um, so I'm going to bump, normally my Wednesday Zoom hours start at 10, 10 noon. Um, so I'm going to have to bump them down to 11 to, I'm going to go an, until 1245 because I have to pick up my kids at 1255. Um, and, you know, the school's literally around the corner. So like, I'm, I'll probably still be on there at like 1252 and I'll be like, all right, peace out, I'm going to go get my kids. Um, so um, I can meet with you more if, if like that time isn't good since I moved it or if you need, you know, more, let me know. And I can also do a Zoom in the afternoon if anybody needs that on Wednesday, especially given how, you know, bizarre everything is. Um, anyway, okay. Um, I, given that so many people are gone for COVID, um, I thought it was only five. It appears like it's more than that. I don't know, you know, or if other people are just not here yet or having other issues. Um, with that information, I was like, we're still going to have the practical quiz on Thursday. Um, and I think I'm going to stick with that. We're still going to do it on Thursday. Um, what we're going to do, though, is instead of having it be where you are, you know, like normal, what a normal practical quiz would look like, where you're going around the room and you're going to different scopes, you're answering questions. Because of the weirdness that's happening right now, I'm going to project it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take images and I'm going to make like a PowerPoint, essentially. And I'm going to have like pointers and crap and questions. So you guys are going to keep your, you know, hot little tushies in the chair, right? So we're not going to be walking around and you're going to be just answering questions based on what's being projected. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to do like a minute and a half per question or per um, slide, because there'll be probably two questions per slide. So a minute and a half per, and I'll just kind of go through. And then what we'll do um, is I'll go through again, the whole thing again with 30 seconds for each one, right? And then after that, if there's anything that anybody wants to go back to, so if you're like, I need number four again, can I just look at number four one more time? Right, you can tell me, I'll, I'll go back to it real quick. Yeah, so hopefully you'll have enough time if I do it that way. And it's a little more rigid than I normally like to be, but I just, I really, given <laughs> what's going on with, Omicron and the peaking and the blah, blah, blah. I really don't like the idea of all of us like breathing on microscopes together, even with our masks on. I just like, I don't want to do it. Okay. So, um, so that's how we're going to handle the parts quiz. The other benefit of that is then I don't need like 45 minutes to physically set it up because I can probably have the PowerPoint ready to go. So the other thing that we'll do on Thursday is after lecture, we'll have like a big break that's like, um, I'm going to guess probably about an hour or so where you guys can, those of you that have been here all along can review stuff. And those of you that have missed can fill in the blanks of what you're missing with whatever, just, you know, quick reviews. Um, everything we're looking at today, if you all could share those images to the picture share assignment, this one, right? That would be amazing um, because... I'm not going to actually start the assignment to do it, but um, so that the people who are not the copious number of people that are not here today can, um, you know, can, can access some of those images. Okay. Um, so that's the, so that's Thursday of this week. Okay. So lecture, big, long break, like I said, probably about an hour or so, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. We'll do the practical, but it'll be projected instead of, you know, walk around. Um, and then I'm not sure what we'll do with the rest of the time. Um, we'll probably do something productive. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to draw everybody's attention to as well is, um, I added a couple of discussions for, uh, just to be sharing space. So <clears throat> with, in the first two weeks of class, there were like six or seven absences because of COVID exposure. 
And I know that that's, I have a feeling that's going to continue for a while. Um, hopefully the, tr the, all of the mathematical modeling about, um, you know, the Omicron variant says that it's kind of like plateauing right now. So hopefully that will reduce, you know, uh, you know, next month and beyond. So I'm hoping it doesn't continue at this pace. Um, but it's just going to be sort of like a fact of life for us this semester that it's like, you're going to have to probably miss sometimes, right? And so my hope is that we can sort of cultivate, ooh, let's let Aisha in. Um, we can sort of cultivate this just like practice of like, you know, teamwork makes the dream work, <laughs> right? We're all going to try to share our stuff with each other because, you know, you never know when it's going to be you next, <laughs> right? And so these are not assignments. This is not something you're graded on. This is not something for points. This is just kind of out of like your own, like, you know, generosity and trying to support each other. So I made two sharing spaces. So um, in the discussions, and you can also, I put it in the modules too, so you can see it there. But um, basically a place for you to share anything lab related other than the actual images for your assignment. So, the, so I did assign that you guys have to post images. There's an assignment for that. But um, anything else you wanna share, like if you were like, I've been taking good notes or I have good drawings, right? Maybe my, you know, my drawings are nice. Even if you don't think they're nice, right? Just share, <laughs> share with each other, okay? And you can just post things, you know, post reply, with attachments or whatever to just share your stuff and maybe write in there what it is. So like, you know, lab notes from such and such date or lab notes about, you know, prokaryotes or whatever, okay? Um, but I think that that would be really nice um, to do. And then there's another one. So there's one for lab stuff and then there's one for lecture stuff just to kind of, you know, make it easier to find things. So in this one, it might be like lecture notes from such and such date, you know? Um, and share any kind of format you want. So if you're somebody that takes notes on paper, you can um, just take a photo of your pages, right? Or use that cam scan thing that I know some of you like to use, right? And post them there. Or you can, if you're a digital note taker, just attach your files or whatever. So um, anyway, I just thought that that would be a, hopefully and maybe a nice thing that we could sort of try to cultivate, okay? Um, so that's due today. So sharing pictures for practicals one is due today. Um, the sooner, the better. Uh, I know it says that it's not due until 1159 tonight, but if you can get stuff up in that, you know, like fairly quickly after class, that would be better so that I can then post them for people to study. So that would be ideal if you can get stuff on there, if you haven't already. Um, or you can add more too, if you're like, I already did the assignment, but there's other pictures that like, you know, that I'm taking today that people might need, okay? Um, this isn't due for a bit. So yeah, so unit one, here's that sharing space. Here's the outline, lectures and whatnot. So uh, as I snarfle. Um, so this week, um, we're gonna hit protists pretty hard. We're gonna talk about endosymbiosis a little bit. Um, there's some links that I'm not going to, we're not going to look at together in class, but they're, you know, kind of useful if you're, you know, wanting to see, you know, how somebody else explains it. Um, there is, there are a couple of articles that I would very much like for you to read carefully and pay attention to, um, that we're actually probably going to discuss next week. So I know you guys are all worried about the practice quiz on Thursday, um, so it's not going to be before Thursday, but um, on Thursday, by Thursday, there will be an assignment for um, to kind of prepare you for a class discussion about the origin of sexual reproduction, which is an article by Zimmer that is not in your packet because of you know copyright laws, but is here. Okay, so um, so there will be instructions about that like I said, by Thursday about like how to prep for that. Cause we're going to have like a class discussion about the article. Okay. And I want to give you some guidance about like what that's going to look like and, you know, give you a little, a little assignment to kind of, you know, force you to <laughs> read and engage with it, you know, like carrot and stick thing. Anyway. Um, and then, yeah, there's the sharing space for that. And the lab notes say we will do the final update to the lab notes as well. Okay. So that um, the stuff that we do today, we'll get, 
can add into that and whatever. Okay, and then there's the big, all of your pictures. These are all the ones that I got before. These are all the ones that Like, any questions about anything that's happening? Weirdness. So we're having a review on Thursday, like right before. The right. Yeah, that's yeah, because that's the only time we can figure it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I mean, it's like because I just, I don't want to screw up our momentum and like if we get off schedule, it's just gonna it's gonna make other things worse later. And I know what the end of the semester looks like in this class, and so we don't want to put things off. So I'm like, let's just go and we'll figure it out and we'll do the best we can and whatever, okay? So I think that's it for reminders and things. So just as another, just because, you know, I'm trying to make sure everybody knows. I'm recording this. So those of you that just got here, just be aware. The camera's not facing you. Your face is not being recorded. Your person is not being recorded, but your voice might be if you ask a question, just so you know, okay? All right. Um, whew. last time we finished up prokaryotes, we talked a little bit about diversity, we talked about kind of just interesting things about prokaryotes. Um, and so today, guess what? We're ready to start, start, uh, start talking about protists. Okay, so let's start, but well, let's start with this. Okay, um, what. Remind me, what is a protus? How about that? Let's start there. What is a protus anyway? Now you have to be all shy. I just recorded. I'm not going to know who's asking the question, okay? Um, anything that's not an animal or fun? Okay, sort of. That's like, you know, 80%. Okay, well, okay, perfect. We got to talk about a nucleus. Any okay. eukaryotes that isn't a animal, fungi, or a plant thing? A plant thing. Okay. Um, all eukaryotes, right? So anybody that's in domain eukarya, remember, yeah? Yes. That is not an animal, a plant, or a fungus, right? And so right there, that grouping seems really like sloppy and not good, right? <laughs> So last time, I think it was last time, we were talking about how it's best if classification reflects phy phylogeny, right? And this is kind of a perfect example of something where that's not necessarily true. Yeah? yeah. Okay, so. Who are we talking about? Um, these are all the different lineages of protists. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you because in a minute we're going to like come back and go through this kind of slowly and kind of talk about each lineage individually. But um, there's this great table. This is from a different textbook. This is not from your textbook. Um, but I think we talked about last time this idea that I really like these images from the book, from the other book, because I like the color coding and it's just for me, it's easier to follow like visually. Um, so refer back to this regularly when necessary. Okay. Now, when we talk about protists, we're doing this weird like game where we're looking at this whole branch of the tree of life and we're saying, all right, this includes everybody on this big branch, except for yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's this weird, like, awkward thing. Okay, so protists are all the weirdos, right? Is the, the kind of shorthand way that I like to think about it, right? Protists are 
all of the eukaryotes, so everybody in domain eukarya, except for the things that we, with our biases, you know, kind of think of as being distinct things. Okay, so it's all the interesting stuff, essentially. Um, so just a little bit of like kind of background about why do we care? Where do they live? What do they do? Why do we care? Okay, so they live all over the place. Right? Um, there is a large um, proportion of protists that are um, marine. Right, so open oceans, um, shallow water, um, even you know, sort of intertidal habitats. So in this image, they're focusing primarily on different types of algae and similar. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of them that live in the water, um, and not just marine, but also. Um, Someone oh, please, thank you. Looks like Kadija is too. Hi, Kadija. Thank you for noticing that. That teamwork thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, right. So, not just marine, but um, freshwater habitats as well. There are lots of protists that are parasites. So, they live in hosts, right? Um, there are some that have a terrestrial lifestyle, they live on land, um, but not as many. Uh, the majority of them are aquatic. Right, of some kind or another, or they live inside of a, ho a host that is moist. Ew. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly aquatic, marine, and freshwater. But others. Right, so terrestrial. Um, Parasites, all of that. Okay. Um, why do we let me turn the volume off on my own? I kind of did that earlier. I did not edit anything. Come on. Volume down. There you go. Okay. Um, <coughs> why do we care about them? Why am I spending time talking about protists at all? Well, they make enough. They make up enough of like human life or something that's very significant. So they're significant. So yes, <laughs> they impact us in a lot of ways that we might not immediately realize. But we're going to kind of go through a list of some ways. Um, but just for the purely sort of you know academic side of things, um, they are really important for helping us understand evolution. Right, because we can look at these phylogenetic trees, yeah, of um, of essentially the entire domain in eukarya, right? Um, right. Um, they can help us learn about evolution because they're such an interesting, diverse group that, you know, has so many different ways of living. Um, they also are really important for um, human health. So don't memorize this. This is just a fun thing to look at. Speaking of human health, you like the, that was a good segue, right? Speaking of human health, <laughs> if anybody's interested in joining the pre-med club, there's a sign-up sheet where you can give them your info so they can contact you. Um, being in clubs is useful, you guys. It's a, it's a good thing that you can say on applications, you know? And I'm assuming you guys are mostly functioning virtually at this point, is that true? All right, so um, anyway. Right, so now's a good time to be <laughs> to be able to say like I was in the club, but it's all virtual, so you don't have to physically be there. 
<laughs> anyway, kind of gonna be it. So think about that. Anyway, you're welcome. <laughs> that was not the best. Do you want to say anything else? <laughs> so um yeah right so if you're going into or you're considering going into any kind of you know medical career right there's good networking in the past i don't know really what the club is doing now that it's more virtual but in the past there was all kinds of good like community service things that the club did and there was um just like a lot of like advising and guest speakers and stuff that were really kind of useful so yeah basically right now we're just having guest speakers and then uh, last semester some spoke to us and um, basically led us to sign up for an internship so yeah I, I mean the application for the internship is still open so you can ask about that in the club awesome awesome very cool okay back to what we're talking about so human health <laughs> okay so this table <clears throat> lists a bunch of different ways that protists can kill you. Um, it's kind of exaggerating, not really, kind of. Um, so look at all of the different um, diseases that are caused by protists. I, I don't know about you guys, but typically when I think about like somebody getting sick, I think, oh, it must be caused by a virus or a bacterium. But it turns out that actually a lot of really significant illnesses um, are caused by protists. So um malaria is caused by a protist called plasmodium you guys looked at plasmodium inside of red blood cells right lovely lovely right so so you were looking at the blood of somebody that was infected with malaria okay underneath the microscope um malaria kills um like more people than any other infectious disease worldwide right malaria is huge um you don't hear about it that much here in the U.S. because it doesn't really impact us. And, you know, everybody's like, well, does this affect me? No. OK, moving on. I don't care. Right. So, <laughs> so you don't hear about it, which is totally screwed up. Right. But but you don't hear about it very much here because of that. Right. But it is, you know, it's really nasty worldwide. It kills lots, lots, lots of people. Um, one thing you do hear about occasionally is um, there's this brain eating amoeba. Um, that lives in warm fresh water and like every so often somebody around here will get one from like playing in lake elsinore do not swim in lake elsinore you guys don't do it don't do it i'm telling you the water's warm bad things grow in warm water warm fresh water okay. it's scary, it's scary. Don't, don't do it right so you'll hear every so often about somebody getting uh getting their brain eaten by an amoeba from uh lake elsinore um, <laughs> Right. Um, the um, organism that's inside of cat poop that is the reason why pregnant ladies should not handle cat litter boxes. What? Right. If you're pregnant, you're not supposed to be around cat litter. It's true. Um, <laughs> right. It is a protist. Um, giardia is a gastrointestinal issue <laughs> that's caused by a protist. Um, and like, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but all kinds of other things, right? Um, sleeping sickness, um, Chagas disease, um, all kinds of other, you know, different amoebic dysentery, right? All kinds of other nasty, nasty, um, digestive stuff. Um, so anyway, okay. So there's like a gazillion, um, so just diseases. Okay. Like I said, don't memorize lots of diseases. Don't memorize, just, you know, yeah, okay? Um, but not just diseases, they also affect us because they have, can impact the food supply. So um, some of you might be familiar with the Irish potato famine. Yeah. Right. Some of you maybe not so much. Um, <laughs> um, there, there was a really bad movie, Far and Away. Is that what it's called? Yeah. With Tom Cruise was in it, Nicole Kidman. Anyway, it's like a romance about these two people coming from Ireland to the U.S. Anyway, immigrants, that whole thing. Um, so it was, it was essentially about the Irish potato famine. It's just you know a romance. Um, 
And the Irish potato famine, basically, people in Ireland up until that point, and I'm not going to give you dates because I don't, I don't do history. Um, I don't know dates for anything. But um, people, their diet was very much dependent on potatoes, right? So people ate tons of potatoes. It was like the staple of their diet, right? No matter how poor you were, it was like, you know, you ate potatoes, okay? Um, so then this really nasty water mold, which is a type of protist, came along and all of the, the major varieties of potatoes that they were growing in Ireland were totally susceptible to this particular water mold. So it just like destroyed the potato crops in Ireland. And since that was like a staple food, people starved. Like it was just, you know, the, it was, it was bad. It was real bad. And so people from Ireland were like fleeing Ireland to try to go to other parts of the world to like flee this like poverty and famine and all of that. And that's where the majority of the Irish population of the U.S. came from, right? Is fleeing Ireland because of a water bowl. <laughs> because of a harvest, right? So if any of you happen to, you know, Okay. get into your like you know 23 and me and you do your ancestry and you're like oh i've got a little bit of irish ancestry um you know it's probably because of the potato famine so you can thank a protest for that okay <laughs> right so it's not just diseases but like crazy things as well um and then another kind of food affected thing is i don't know if you all have ever heard about um red tides a, a red tide is um a situation where you have a bloom of a type of produce called dinoflagellates in a marine environment. And what happens is these particular dinoflagellates are like nasty. They produce these nasty toxins that build up in the organisms that eat them. So it builds up in the food chain for brief periods of time. So during a red tide, um, all kinds of food that people normally would harvest from you know, marine ecosystems become like toxic so you're not eating clams that were harvested during that time right or you know crustaceans or whatever okay so that's another one so this one was from a water mold this one is from a dinoflagellate there are other dinoflagellates that are um bioluminescent right so if you've ever then have the opportunity to see um, bioluminescence in the water um, that's typically caused by um, dino, an abundance of dinoflagellates, which is kind of cool. So okay. like jellyfish? They, they're not jellyfish. They're just these individual little unicellular guys that are too small for you to see with the naked eye. That like you can see like when the water, when the waves like crash, they like glow. And there's nothing like you can't see any large organism in there because they're just these tiny little unicellular things. Kind of cool. They're algae, right? They're a dinoflagellate. So not exactly an algae. This is the problem with protists, right? <laughs> like with protists, we just call everything like, oh, it's an algae or it's a whatever. So dinoflagellates are not that kind of, but there's so many different kinds of algae that the word algae sort of becomes meaningless, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, because there's so many different kinds and they're also very different from each other. So anyway, so dinoflagellate is a better descriptor, okay? All right, so, <sighs> ooh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself, okay. Um, also, they're very ecologically important. <laughs> So um, we're not going to get into too many um, food webs and all of that, just because that's something you do more in 63. But the protist population in oceans in particular, but even in freshwater, are really strong, like fundamental base of that whole like food web, right? So if we're looking at any kind of marine food web, it's all a bunch of protists at the bottom, right? So it's different types of algae or other photosynthetic protists um, that are producers, right? Or autotrophs, remember some of that vocabulary, yeah? And they get consumed by carnivorous, sometimes protists, 
right? Um, or herbivorous protists sometimes, but also other things in plankton like um, crustaceans and all that kind of stuff. So this is mostly you're, what you're looking at mostly here. You're looking at um, crustaceans and things, right? But, um, you know, that all ultimately acts as the base of the, you know, the food web that ultimately keeps the oceans alive. Um, more oxygen is made by protists in the ocean, photosynthetic protists in the ocean, than trees. Right? So my my kid, my nine-year-old, you know, we were driving around after that the big wind last week, you know, and all the trees are down, and it was like wild. And my son was like, so does that mean that there's like less oxygen in the air because all these trees have died? And I was like, well. I mean, technically, yeah, but like <laughs> the amount is not going to impact you. So like, don't worry about it because he's a warrior. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> and so I like almost went into my like teacher like tangent about, well, you know, actually, you know, <laughs> if we're concerned about oxygen availability in our atmosphere, what we really should be concerned about is all of the health of our oceans because those photosynthetic protists, that photosynthetic plankton is, you know, produces a lot more oxygen than trees do. Not to say that trees aren't important. Everybody go hug a tree and save the trees and all of that, right? <laughs> it is an important contribution, of course, but um, the ocean's just as much, right? So there you are, okay? So really, really ecologically important um, basis of food chain, food web, I should say, food web in oceans. And freshwater environments, right? Important photosynthesizers. Okay. All right. So uh, there are photosynthetic plankton as well. Yeah. Yeah. I thought there were animals. No, there's, well, plankton, it depends on how you're using the word plankton. All of the vocabulary is really like sloppy, which <laughs> is the problem. So plankton typically refers to just like any of the little tiny things that are floating around in the water, kind of, okay. right? Um, and so, so, so if you're being sloppy about it, yes. But you're right. The majority of like actual plankton is animals. Like what the, the the better use of the word, right? But there's all these different types of unicellular algae and algae relatives and other protists that are photosynthetic that are all mixed into that. Mm -hmm. That like when somebody's being sort of sloppy, it's like oh you know plankton and stuff, right? It's like it, they they often mean the whole. All of the little things. It's like the same thing with algae. They're just like embroiled. Right, right. Okay. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Not, I mean, yeah. Anyway. Complicated. This is partially a weird question, but does that mean SpongeBob is not accurate? Like the no, wait. <laughs> no, SpongeBob is a lie. Oh, there are no yeah. pineapples under the sea. Okay. <laughs> Squidward doesn't have the right number of arms. It's just, it's all this. Um, <laughs> he has six, huh? He has six. I don't, I, it's, it's, it should be 10 if he's a squid, and it's not 10. I don't know how many it is. <laughs> Wait, his name is Squidward. Come on. Oh my gosh, you guys are going to be my. So a couple, a couple of years ago, I had a Bio 62 class that was my Nemo class because they kept asking me questions about like, but in Finding Nemo, blah, 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 blah. I was like, no, Disney is not telling you the truth. They are not an authority on marine life. So SpongeBob is even worse. <laughs> is an even worse authority on marine life. Um, so what were you going to say, though, about SpongeBob? I don't remember, but like, this is great tangent. <laughs> Wait, it didn't, okay, so like. Yeah, man. Squirrels really. don't put on, you know. Well, yeah. That's preposterous. 
I know they don't have boats. <laughs> Why do they drive boats? <laughs> how does and how do they have a beach? I don't like, none of it makes any sense. They swim in the ocean. How does that fire work? Let's not go on this tangent. Okay. So, <laughs> so where were we? All right. So permits are important <laughs> for a variety of reasons, right? Practically speaking, they help us. Um, they can be dangerous for us. They can, you know, they're important for other organisms, right? So they're, and just, you know, evolutionarily fascinating, okay? So here is our big picture, beautifully rainbow colored <laughs> um, so tree that we looked at briefly um, last time. Um, so I'm going to have you remind me um, who's the, since we're practicing getting really good at reading phylogenetic trees, okay? okay. Um, what's my out group here? The bacteria. Bacteria, bacteria and archaea yeah. are both, are like two out groups in this case, because they're trying to sort of remind you and ground you and say, this is a tree for all of life, right? And right now we're not paying attention to the details over here. So we're just kind of keeping them off to the side as, a, as an out group. Right, but it's to ground you and remind you that everybody else from this point on, right, is a eukaryote. Okay, so we are done with prokaryotes for now. We are moving into only eukaryotes from now until the rest of the semester. All right. Okay. There was also that bit about what what is a protist. It's it's all of the eukaryotes that are not animals, plants, or fungi. The way that they're showing you that in this image, because fundamentally those are, they're all part of the eukaryotic family tree, of course, right? So the way that they're showing you that um, is with these little dashed lines. So they're saying, okay, well, within this lineage of protists, these two dashed lines, we, we don't call those protists. We call those fungi and animals, right? And within this lineage, here's another dash line. We don't call these protists. We call them plants, <laughs> right? And so based on the fact that we are looking at the majority of a tree, but we are picking and choosing certain groups, certain taxa to remove from the tree, one of these words describes the term protist is a, are protists a group that is monophyletic, paraphyletic, or polyphyletic? Paraphyletic? Polyphyletic. Okay, so we're, we're in agreement that it's not monophyletic, right? Yes. Okay, good. Good. Check. Okay, we understand that. Awesome. <laughs> Now the thing is we have to decide between these two. So what is par what is the difference again between paraphyletic and polyphyletic? Uh, for me, I'm paraphyletic because they leave one out, while polyphyletic is adding one in with the kind of right. So so paraphyletic is you're you're picking and choosing which ones to leave out of the group. Uh, Whereas polyphyletic is you're making an assemblage of things that is kind of like from a bunch of different groups. Yeah. 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 Sure. That makes sense. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So if that if we're going with that definition, then protists are paraphyletic. Yeah. yeah. Paraphyletic group. Right? And that's one of the problems with this, like, you know, the way that they're classified. So so it's a mess. It's a hot mess. Okay. So going forward, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focusing on different lineages or you know fairly large groups of protists, um, and kind of focusing on it that way, right? Sort of thinking about okay, well, there's this group of protists that are like this, and there's this other group of protists that are like this. Okay. And so we'll keep our color coding, and it'll be really cute and easy to follow, and all of that. Okay, and some of these, hopefully some of these names already look sort of familiar because they were mentioned either this morning or when we were looking at stuff in lab last time. So like you guys remember seeing an amoeba, right? Yes. Right, and 
um, euglena, as you saw, euglena, right, in lab. And we haven't looked at algae yet, but you, you've heard that term before, <laughs> right? Whether it's used appropriately or not. Um, and then, oh, foraminiferins. We looked at some of those last time, right? We did, we looked at a, a cilia, and we also looked at a pico complexin, but you might not remember those names. And then white holes, hey, that's one of the ones that I just talked about, right? This morning, the Irish famine, tater famine bubble. Okay, so we're going to go through those different groups, but before we do that, before we go through the groups, sorry, being weird, <laughs> sorry, right, and so I, sh I should mention again, this is the same tree, I said this in lab last time, but just, you know, as a good reminder, <clears throat> this is the, the phylogenetic tree of the protist that's in Campbell. I like this one better, which is why I show it. Because <laughs> it's just, it's so much easier for my brain to deal with like right colors that are distinct, whereas this one's like, I don't remember, they're all kind of muted and blah, blah, blah. But fundamentally, it's the same table, okay? Um, but even though it's the same table, there's still stuff in sort of different places, right? Because here's the deal with phylogenetics. We're constantly updating tables. Right, as we're learning more, we're constantly updating the trees, right? We're constantly like tweaking where things are, right? So, you know, between when this textbook was published and when this textbook is published, and now we're on a we're we're already on a new edition of Campbell. You guys are using the old Campbell now. Um, it, it's like they're they're constantly updating this stuff. So, you know, in three years from now, when they put out a new one, it's gonna be tweaked again because they're learning more particularly a lot about protists because microscopic things tend to not get the love and attention that big, big cute things do with, you know, fur, <laughs> right? We pay a lot more attention to pandas than we do to Wait, is it true that silly. pandas are no longer endangered? I do not know that. That's a, we'll talk about that some more time, though. There will be pandas stories later, but not now. Okay, yeah. very end of the semester that you could live a long time. Okay, so essentially same idea, okay? Um, right, so here's just the side by side of kind of like looking at like, are they really different? How are they different? What ways are they different? Eh, kind of not really, there's a lot of, right? So even though this one looks really different, check it out, alveolata and the stromatopilla are still right next to each other. And then those two are both next to the rhizarians, which are right here. Right, so it's like even though it looks really different, it's eh, mostly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I don't know how much of this all you all learned in forty or sixty one. So we're gonna go on a little bit of a walk through um, endosymbiosis. Okay, just to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page. So how? did eukaryotic cells come to be? We talked about, how, about the hypothesis, the, the four-part hypothesis for how life started on Earth. What were those four parts? Oh, God. Oh. I'll erase while you all. Uh, the first part was the Miller-Urey experiment. So the Miller-Urey experiment, which showed that you can get what? Organic monomers. You can get organic monomers from non-organic from inorganic materials, right? With enough energy and heat and excitement, <laughs> right? You can take inorganic chemicals and make organic monomers out of it. So that was the first step. What was the second step? Formation of polymers. Formation of polymers. So once again, this is a high energy thing, right? Energy of activation is pretty high for making polymers out of monomers. So most of the time in living systems, that happens with the help of enzymes to lower activation energy. But back in the, you know, back in the battle days, right? You know, it could have been energy related to volcanic activity or, you know, thunderstorms with lightning and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Third step. Self-replication of information molecules. Right, so you've got to have information molecules. Which one was the first one to, to come on scene? RNA. RNA, RNA why? Simpler. Because it's simpler, right? And so RNA was, was the first genetic <laughs> material because it's so 
easily kind of replicates. Once again, it's faster and more efficient with the help of enzymes, but if given enough time and just left alone, RNA will self-replicate, okay, if there's enough monomers floating around. And then what was the last step? Free cells. Free cells. Mm -hmm. Plasma membranes slash phospholipids. Phospho phospholipids are the, I should be, I'm sorry, I'm thirsty. Phospholipids make up the bulk of the plasma membrane, right? Sure. And plasma membrane yeah. spontaneously, when you have a bunch of phospholipids together, they spontaneously form these membranes because of the tails and the, yeah? Yeah. I'm not going over that again because you remember that from 40 or 61. Okay. Um, now, so, how, so that explains how we get the prokaryotic cells. How did we get eukaryotic cells? Okay, so what's different? What's different between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell? They're more complicated because they have organelles. Because they have organelles. DNA. No. Okay. Um, pro pro most prokaryotes use DNA too. Cool. So that's the same. Which ones do not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's probably some that you just use RNA. If I had to guess, oh, especially real early they ones. Still have like genetic material. But yeah, they still have genetic material. It's just probably there's just I'm sure there are some that are RNA. That's a good question, actually. I don't, and I'm not a good enough um, microbiologist to know. There might be, I don't know. That's, a, that's actually a really good question. Because the earliest ones probably were RNA based. I don't know if there are any RNA based ones now, though, or if it's all just, um, you know, DNA. That's an interesting thing to think about. Anyway, okay. How do, where do those organelles come from? Where does your envelope come from? Membranes. Membranes. All right. So there's this kind of like, for some reason, my keyboard is not working. All right. You're doing that. Button. So there is, um, there was a series of events that produced what we now know as eukaryotic cells. Okay, and the number of events that occurred and, you know, sort of the order that they occurred in varies by different groups of um, protists, different groups of eukaryotes. Okay, so endosymbiosis. What does that name mean? Endosymbiosis mean? Endo, you should know this because you know about endocytosis. What does endo mean? External. Opposite. Inside. Inside, right? So endo is Greek for within or inner. Extra. Okay. Um, sim, what does sim mean? Uh, 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 gosh, there's a lot of S words. Mm -hmm. Sim, sim means with or together. Also Greek, right? So endo so far means inside and then together. Okay, and then bio means life. life. So living together inside is like the literal translation of endosymbiosis, okay? Essentially what this means is one cell lives inside another cell, okay? So primary endosymbiosis is Likely, right? How mitochondria came to exist. 
Okay, so. So, here we have, this is, like I said, this is an example of primary endosymbiosis. So, you've got this host cell, and you've got this bacterium, and the little orange bacterium that they're showing you in that, in that diagram um, represents a bacterium that is very efficient and aerobic. So, what is that aerobic, anaerobic, what do those terms mean? With oxygen, um, with oxygen, with oxygen, without oxygen. So talking about what kind of metabolism they have. Do they do cellular respiration? Do they do um, fermentation, right? So we've got this bacterium that has an aerobic metabolism, right? That gets engulfed by a larger bacterium, okay? Normally that's how bacteria eat, right? I'm gonna engulf you and I'm gonna digest. I'm gonna use my lysosomes to digest you. Right, I mean that if it was a eukaryote, if it's not a eukaryote, it doesn't have like some, but that's a whole other thing, right? And digest it. That's your food. Okay, break it down. Um, but what if that other bacterium just like hung around, right? And it didn't break down. And hey, look at that! That that little orange guy, as it turned out, <laughs> right, does a really good job of making ATP. Yeah, so is that the presence of that bacterium inside of the host cell turns out to be a pretty big advantage, right? Because you've got this like essentially like a little ATP machine living inside of you that makes ATP more efficiently than you do on your own, right? So it sticks around, right? And since it's a, an individual cell, it can reproduce. So when the host cell divides, the babies, the new cells are going to be most successful if they also contain one of the little orange guys too, because that guy can replicate itself because it's a bacterium, right? So then the offspring have them, right? And the ones that have it survive. The ones that didn't, you know, aren't lucky enough to get one, maybe are not at, at as big an advantage. Yeah. And so what you end up with is like this permanent relationship over time. Yeah, so that ultimately that bacterium that got engulfed can't live on its own, right? It, it requires the presence of a host, but the advantage that it gives to the host is big, right? Because it makes ATP so much more efficiently than the host cell did. Are you with me so far? So do we see genetic material in like organelles today? In mitochondria, we do. Oh, really? Right? Mitochondria have their own separate circular chromosome that is independent from the rest of the DNA in your cells. Oh. So every single cell in your body that has mitochondria in it, right, has a separate genome than the rest of your DNA in the nucleus of your cell. Yeah? Right? So this is one of the cool things that they use with genetic analysis, looking at family trees and stuff, is if you look at mitochondrial DNA, you get a different story than if you look at nuclear DNA. Because where do you get your mitochondria from? Your mom. Your mom. Because mitochondria are inside of eggs. But sperm, remember all, when fertilization happens, the only thing that sperm contributes is basically they like inject DNA into the egg. So you don't get any organelles from dad, right? All of your organelles, like your mitochondria and those kinds of things come from the egg, so come from mom. So if you track mitochondrial DNA in a family, you're looking at only sort of one side of your you know, parents, 
right? So you can actually see a pattern more clearly if you're not looking at the mixing of DNA from two parents, right? And you're just looking at like a matrilineal line. Yeah. So mitochondrial DNA is cool because A, it tells us that this is where mitochondria came from, <laughs> right? And mitochondrial DNA, even though this happened, you know, billions of years ago, this event, right? Um, it turns out that mitochondrial DNA still has a lot of things in common with bacterial DNA because mitochondria are essentially just bacteria that have been co-opted. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. That also explains the um, what mitochondria look like, right? So this is my bad drawing of the mitochondria. I know you appreciate it a lot. You're gonna love it. And you're gonna be like, Sarah, that is an amazing picture. You are a talented artist. You really missed your calling. That's actually not that bad. Ha <laughs> <laughs> See. <laughs> so they kind of look like this one, right? But what do you notice about the number of membranes here? Right? Do you remember? You might not remember this because this was <laughs> right. When you were learning about cellular respiration, you probably learned about how mitochondria have an outer membrane and then they have an inner membrane. And the inner membrane is where all the exciting stuff happens on the electron transport chain. Inner membrane, outer membrane. Yeah. How do you get two membranes on a thing? Well, one way that that can happen is if our host cell engulfs another cell and then pinches closed, guess what this thing has now? It's got two membranes. An outer membrane, which came from the host, and the inner membrane, which was the plasma membrane of the bacterium that got engulfed. That was crazy. Okay, is that cool? Okay, so endosymbiosis, this is just fun factoids for you to think about. The, the theory of you know, endosymbiosis was not seriously considered until the 1970s. So this is actually a fairly recent idea. I was born in the 1970s, <laughs> the late 1970s, be clear. <laughs> right? But I was born in 78. Yeah? And so this was like new <laughs> when I was born. This idea that this could happen was new, right? So I think one of the things that, that students often think about is you think, well, like everybody's figured out everything already. Like science, everybody's figured out stuff already. But it's like, they figured this out in the 70s. And that's when it just first started getting, people were like, not laugh you know, at for their ideas. It was like, well, maybe, I don't know. I mean, that could maybe make sense. Maybe. Right. But a lot of the details of this are actually much more recent than the seventies, right. Of the details of understanding what's happening. Okay. Um, so mitochondria, right. Were a result of primary symbiosis and or endosymbiosis, sorry. Endosym right around 200 billion years ago okay and we know the evidence that we have for this is that mitochondria are similar to bacteria in their size the way that they divide they divide by binary fission like bacteria do they have their own ribosomes not only do they have their own dna separate from the nuclear dna in a eukaryotic cell but they also have their own ribosomes. The presence of that double membrane, right, would be a result of this process of engulfing, right? And they have their own circular chromosome like bacteria do, right? So there's like all of these indicators that are like, yeah, no, mitochondria are totally bacteria. <laughs> they just are, right? And now they don't survive outside of a eukaryotic cell like you can't just like culture some mitochondria because you know they've lost some of their features that make them independent because you know they're doing so great inside of this host so now they become dependent on that that host cell that eukaryotic cell right but it's still really clear that they are fundamentally bacteria and this actually i'm going to go back to 
Am I going to go back to it? Let's go back to this for a sec. Remember this? <clears throat> Well, remember this image? Mitochondria, why is it what? What? Right? Mitochondria were, are a type of proteobacteria, right? That got engulfed by a eukaryotic ancestor and then, you yeah, know, stuck around, <laughs> right? So mitochondria came first. That's what this diagram is telling you, is that mitochondria right, joined with a host cell and produced what we now know as eukaryotes, right, before chloroplasts came along. So we'll go back to chloroplast. So, so now we'll discuss how do you get a chloroplast, okay? So how do you get a chloroplast? Well, chloroplasts are an example of secondary What do you think that means, secondary endosymbiosis? They weren't the first. <laughs> so in this case, it's not an order, it's not like an order of operations, like which one happened first. It's more like something got engulfed and then that cell got engulfed by somebody even bigger. So endosymbiosis happened twice. Or in some cases, three times, tertiary, yeah? Okay, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at, okay, here's some sort of predatory, you know, imaginary predatory protist. And here's a little photosynthetic protist. Well, how do you get a photosynthetic protist? Who does photosynthesis? If we plants. go back to, okay, but before plants, this is before plants existed. Cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria, right, go all the way back right? So cyanobacteria are the ones that are doing photosynthesis. So what would happen if a cyanobacterium was engulfed by another bacterium that was not photosynthetic? The nucleus from the photosynthetic protist is lost. It may or may not be right away, right? But this chlor, what they're calling a chloroplast here is actually, this is sort of confusing because it leaves out a bunch of steps. But the idea being that you had a cyanobacterium that was photosynthesizing, doing its thing. It got engulfed by another bacterium. Kind of like this story, right? Same idea, but instead of an aerobic guy, it was a photosynthetic guy. Right, yeah. and it got and it got engulfed, and then it stuck around because hey, having a cell inside of you that makes sugar is pretty cool. <laughs> That's an advantage, right? That's a big advantage, right? So that maybe that sticks around. Maybe you don't digest that, right? It sticks around, right? And then what happens if that then gets engulfed by another cell, and it sticks around? Right, so you're, this image is talking about secondary endosymbiosis, but actually technically what they're showing you is tertiary. So I'm gonna show you, which one do I like? I like this one better actually, no, yes. Let's look at this one and then we'll go back, okay? So what's the story that I'm telling you? We have a cyanobacterium. Yeah? Sure. It gets engulfed by a host cell. Oh. And now you have this thing that has how many membranes? Two. One, two. Right? Because it had its own original membrane and then that little bit of membrane from the host. Okay? 
Now, that, that was the end of the line in the group of organisms that we now know as red algae, right? So red algae have these plastids. They're technically not chloroplasts because chloroplast is like a specific thing, but they have these plastids, right? So plastid is the more generic term. Right, that have two membranes. Okay, same thing is true for green algae and land plants. Okay, so we had this endosymbiosis event happen a couple different times. Now, what if that red algae cell, the ancestor of red algae, got engulfed again, right? Now we've got a whole nother set of membrane, yeah? So now we've got one, we got green, orange, blue. So we've got three membranes on that structure. So we've got a plastid in brown algae, golden algae, diatoms, which are all examples of heterocons, which we'll come back to in a second, right? These guys that have totally different plastids than these guys. So this is why I was saying the term algae is kind of like, because green algae are fundamentally very different from red algae and the golden algae, brown algae and the diatoms are even more different than either one of those. And for that matter, <laughs> the dinoflagellates are even more different than those, right? So the term algae is kind of this like awkward umbrella term, right? Okay. so got engulfed, it's got three membranes. Well, what happened if that three membrane guy got engulfed again? It would have four membranes. Now it has four membranes. So now it's got the green membrane, the orange membrane, the blue membrane, and then another orange, because they, I don't know, they didn't want to change their colors. Maybe that's supposed to be brown, whatever. Yeah? Yeah. And then our euglenoids were, did, did secondary symbiosis on their own too, but it's different than these guys, right? So the punchline is this: I don't, I don't particularly care that you that you can like recite back to me. And the plastids in the dinoflagellates were a result of tertiary endosymbiosis, whereas <laughs> the plastids that are found in red algae were only primary endosymbiosis. Okay, I don't really care about that so much as I want to make sure that you understand what that means and that it's variable. So some protists have plastids that just have two membranes because endosymbiosis happened once. Some have three membranes because endosymbiosis happened twice and others have three membranes because endosymbiosis happened, well, four, I'm sorry, four membranes because it happened three times. Sorry, I lost my, started thinking about something else. That's bad news when I do that, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so like, don't try to memorize which ones have what kind, because I, you know, whatever, right? But just understand the difference, okay? So, So that's how we got all of the different types of plastids, chloroplasts, along with other types of plastids. This is another term that we're not, we sort of use sloppily, right, is the chloroplast. So it's like, oh, if it's photosynthetic, we're just going to call them all chloroplasts. It's like, no, but they don't all have chlorophyll, so blah, blah, whatever. But, you know, there's different kinds of plastids. So this is a... Um, Kind of sketchy diagram that came out. This actually was published in a paper. The people who originally, you know, figured this out. This was their drawing, and then this one is a little bit more um, 
lifelike, if you will. This is the drawing of the same concept in your, in your textbook. So it's saying, okay, we've got this eukaryote that engulfs a cyanobacterium and we got membranes, right? And then we got, so we got a couple different types of that. So one of them is the red algae, one of them is the green, and then we have secondary endosymbiosis happening again, and that's how we get these other guys, right? Okay, so that is that information of who engulfed who and how you can end up with this and that and the other thing is one of the big features that actually helped produce these tables, right? To produce these trees, right? If we know that these guys have plastids, right, that are similar to these, but this got engulfed by the thing and then this got engulfed by another thing and then that, right? That helps us make that that family tree. Yeah? Okay. So that's how, that's secondary endosymbiosis. So primary was the end of the line for mitochondria. Mitochondria came to be as a result of primary endosymbiosis. Chloroplasts came as a result of primary and or secondary and or tertiary endosymbiosis. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But both of those, and, and so for all the same reasons, right? They have their own DNA, chloroplasts have their own DNA that is very similar to cyanobacteria DNA, right? Because they essentially, chloroplast is a cyanobacterium, just with a bunch of extra membranes on it. Yeah? Okay. All right. But there's one other part that we need to consider. So we, when we talk about eukaryotes, we talk about them being different because they have in addition to organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts, what are the other things that and uh, that eukaryotic cells have? Nuclear envelope. They have a nuclear envelope and they have that whole endomembrane system. You guys remember that? The Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum, ER, rough and smooth ER, and the lysosomes and vacuoles and all that crap. Those are all just membranes, basically. Yeah? Well, how do you get more membranes inside of a cell? <laughs> so it's basically little infoldings, right? So invagination of the, of the plasma membrane, if it folds in and those infoldings kind of like pinch off, guess what? It does that, right? You end up with membranes floating around inside. So little bits of membrane kind of fold in and eventually they kind of pinch off. And some of them are wrapped around the nucleus. And you know what? That turns out to be a handy little trick because if your nucleus is protected, you know? Yeah. Right? So uh, I have a good friend who likes to describe the difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell as being like the difference between a studio apartment and a mansion. Right? So both of them are homes that have, you know, a kitchen, a bathroom, a place to sleep, a place to sit, right? But like in a prokaryotic cell, all of those things are happening in one space. And that can be a little sloppier, right? Than if you have a distinct space for each thing, right? Less messy, more organized, more efficient in some ways, right? Because you can have these membranes that specialize to do certain things if you've got a bunch of membranes in there, yeah? And if on top of that, you've also had endosymbiosis where you've got, now you've got these trapped bacteria that are, you know, essentially your little internal servants for life, <laughs> right? Forever and ever and ever for all of time, right? That's a huge advantage, yeah? So that's the other part that kind of goes with this is that you have this infolding of the plasma membrane is responsible for the nuclear envelope and all of the membrane, all of the endomembrane organelles. So like I said, the endomembrane system includes 
Ruffy R, Smoothie R, Bulgy Apparatus, Lysosomes, Vacuoles, any of those other organelles that you all learned about in 40 and 61 that are basically just like sheets or bags of membrane. <laughs> So uh, could that have been like a response to something? Sure. Like, do we know? It, I mean, all of these things probably happened multiple times, right? And only sometimes were they like, you know, successful and they, you know, continued, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, anything could make a cell fold in on itself, right? If there was some sort of, if it was trying to eat something and it didn't, and it made like and it engulfed a piece of membrane, but like it missed. And then now there's a piece of membrane that's inside of the cell that didn't, for whatever reason, didn't get incorporated back into the outer membrane. But does that result in like a change in its genome? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, yeah, it, well, it could, it certainly could, right? Um, especially if we're starting to have membranes that originally kind of end up inside of the cell accidentally, but end up, um, you know, being functional or being able to do something. In that case, then it would be, yeah, it would have to be like a genetic change that codes for that to happen, right? Like some of this membrane has to be inside of the cell in order to do X, Y, Z. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's where eukaryotic cells came from, right? So there's a couple of prokaryotes that are um, so anaerobic one and a photosynthetic one, just to show you that like more membranes means more surface for what? Stuff to happen. Yes. Right? The more membranes you have, particularly if we're talking about energy transforming organelles like mitochondria. And chloroplast, think about the anatomy of a chloroplast. I'll, I'll, I'll try to draw a chloroplast, that'll be fun. So here's my chloroplast. Remember how it has those like stacks of membrane? It's called bilocoids. What they're called? Yeah. Okay, cool. I thought they were called grana. Yeah, all together, yes. Oh. But individually, each stack is called a bilocoid. More you know. Lots of vocabulary, but whatever. You know what I'm talking about, though, right? Those little green, like, they look like a stack of quarters or whatever, or like yeah. poker chips. Yeah. <laughs> Those are stacks of membrane because more membrane means more surface area to do more electron transport chain. Yeah, more light reactions. Or if we're talking about mitochondria, more membrane means more surface for electron transport chain that produces ATP. <laughs> yeah? Sure. Okay. So folding in of membranes turns out to be highly useful. So it's not surprising that it became common because it makes you better at whatever you're trying to do. Yeah? That was very teleological. It makes you better at whatever you're trying to do, as if there was some sort of design, right? But this accident of infolding turns out to be such an advantage. Yeah? That it persists. Correct myself. I should correct myself all the time. Okay. So, because of all of this weird endosymbiosis stuff, you end up with all kinds of like, okay, well, but where did your plastid come from? Well, there are certain things about the cell. Right about this cell and that cell, right? That make it make us put it on this branch. But then the chloroplasts. Well, it turns out that the chloroplasts from green algae um, got engulfed by an ancient rhizarian, and so some rhizarians now have chloroplasts, and um, not all, but lots of alveolates and um, stramanopilla, so dinoflagellates, diatoms, brown algae, those all have chloroplasts from red algae, right? So it makes everything much more complicated when it's like, you know, the rest of the cell has this family history, but then one of them engulfed this other thing, and now what? <laughs> How do I deal with that? How do I deal with that? Right, so don't try to like memorize all of this back and forth because the details, I, you know, I don't really care that you memorize the details. I care that you understand the problem and you understand the complication. 
Yeah? Okay. How, how do we feel about that? Are we cool? Cool. Okay, so what time is it? I've been talking a long time. So let me just kind of... Oh, baby, life cycles are next. I'm so excited. You guys are going to hate me. You're going to hate me with a fiery passion, but I'm going to have so much fun. Okay, um, so we'll talk a little bit more about some of the sort of variety that's in Protus, and then we'll start talking about life cycles next time. And then we'll start going through like the march through all of the different, you know, types of Protus. Okay, and then after that, um, Tuesday of next week, we'll start talking about um, multicellularity insects. Okay, questions? Let me check. I've been, I've been totally ignoring the chat, and nobody sent them. And that's fine. Just like that's, paragraphs. <laughs> you're like, but, but stop, slow down. Uh, I did warn them that like I was going to be a mess and not do a good job. So, um, anywho, okay. So I'm going to stop recording, and then maybe I'll record again when we do lab stuff. We'll see. Yes, I want to stop.